Welcome, Greek U Nation, to episode number 289 of the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Ayalon, CEO of Greek University. I'm a speaker and a two-time author. Our second book is called From Letters to Leaders, Redefining New Member Education and Leveraging Belonging to Eliminate Hazing, which is available now on Amazon. So go and pick up that book today. We call these episodes the Fraternity Foodie Podcast because there is nothing like great food to bring college students together. Fun fact, when I graduated from college, I bought a brand new Ford Mustang because I thought I had earned it and I needed my own apartment as well with no roommates whatsoever. That mindset created a struggle for me early on in my career, and it would have been so much smarter to start putting some money into some investments and benefiting from the time value of money. Having a financial plan early is really the best thing you can do to ensure a comfortable retirement later on. And our next guest is going to help you get there. Alan J. McMillan is the founder of Learn, Earn, Retire, the informational resource for students and early employees transitioning from campus to career to their eventual financial independence. He is a retired high-tech exec who held the VP of sales role four times in Silicon Valley with venture-funded startups. He discovered a new calling when he identified an unmet need, and that is helping college students understand what it takes to figure out what they want in their career and in their life, nail their education, get a job that is the first step in an amazing career, and have the skills to maintain employability over the arc of their career, as well as develop a plan that can lead to financial independence without demoting their lifestyle. He has spoken to thousands of students across America in live lectures and has built a formal curriculum in colleges, including an acclaimed class at Ohio University. Welcome to the show, Alan. Hey, Michael. Great to be here. It's great to have you on. I mean, I love your background. I love everything that you're doing. So I think this is really relevant to the college students who are listening right now. So I really appreciate you being on the show with us today. Now, interestingly enough, I know, you know, we were talking a little bit before we went live, but um, my kids, they're brilliant. Nothing like their old man. Okay. They clearly got their smarts from my wife. I mean, that is obvious to me. Now, <laughs> we went on a tour of Boston. We went to some fine schools. We, we took a look at Harvard. We took a look at Boston University and we looked, took a look at MIT. I was really blown away at MIT. I think that they're offering some amazing education over there. The quality of the students were just completely over the top, which I absolutely loved. And interestingly enough, you got your MBA at what's called the MIT Sloan Fellows Program. Now, for those who don't know what that is, that is a 12-month full-time residential program with over 100 students per cohort from over 40 different countries. Now, I know it's taken you back a little while, but talk to us a little bit about what that experience was like for you. Well, it was crazy because <laughs> to, to even make this a wilder story, I had uh, graduated from Ohio University in 1975 with an associate degree. Right. You know, I wanted out. I wanted <laughs> to go out and make some money. I wanted to you move in. And then that led to hitchhiking across the country. Later in life, I got on the ground floor of the personal computer revolution and in succession planning, the CEO wanted to start to have some of the guys that are coming up uh, that he thought had the potential of running the company in the future get some education. So he said, we'll send you to any business school you want for a year. Um, and he said, no 90-day wonder programs, any business school for a year to prepare you for this. And uh, I'm sitting there going, this is not a good time to remind him that I don't have a bachelor's degree. So so I, I was fortunate that uh, I had befriended a great guy, turned into a great mentor, Theodore Levitt, who was then the editor of the Harvard Business Review. And I asked Ted, what do I do? And he goes, huh. He's looking out the window with these big bushy eyebrows. He goes, why don't you head down to MIT and apply to be a Sloan Fellow? I'm going, Ted, if there's one place in the world that will never have me, it's there. Anyway. He uh, said, wait two days and make the call. So apparently he sent something down and uh, and and it's just an amazing story. I kept waiting for someone to, you know, tap me on the shoulder and just say, you know, we made a horrible mistake. We don't hurt your feelings, but you need to leave the classroom right now. But it was a life changing program. I just came back from a, a reunion with my classmates who went on to do like great things. And, you know, you become who you hang out with. And I think there, there's a, there's a relevant story in there. And these were some bright happening people 
And uh, it was incredibly exciting, but it was like having my head in a microwave oven for a year. Uh, but then uh, off to Silicon Valley and take it from there. That's a great story. Not enough people know about uh, that MIT Sloan Fellows Program. So I'm so happy you got a chance to talk about it a little bit and just, you know, educate some of the people out there about that program. I think it's a fantastic experience and I'm glad you had the opportunity to do it. You also spent 38 years in high tech sales and marketing, like I mentioned in the intro, four times as VP of sales in Silicon Valley. And you were on the senior management team twice when the companies were taken successfully into the public market. So I am definitely 100% sure that you've seen both success and failure over that time period. And for all the students that are thinking about bringing some new product or new service to the market, what advice do you have from them based on all of your experience? I'd say, you know, one of the big components, and I made some mistakes early in my career. And when I teach, you know, I put those on the table. Hopefully people can go ahead and learn from that. But I uh, I didn't do enough investigation and listening uh, early in my career. And I got it right as I went from my 20s to my 30s. And then uh, things, you know, started to really progress. But you've, you've got to have a solid opportunity. That's, if, if it's pre-public, it's backed by the right venture capital organizations. That tells you a lot right there. And, uh, and you've got to be a student of people who are doing the job that you're aspiring to be, what are the attributes that an employer looks for, you know, uh, in a new hire? And then you take a look at where you are, and then that variance between the two is your development plan. Mm -hmm. And then you go ahead and try to march in and become more valuable in the marketplace. And, and, it's, and it can be more precision than just going from one job to the next. You, you can manage this in a way to, uh, get great, you know, great results. Yeah, I think you bring up a great point. And I talk to college students about networking all the time while they're in college. There are plenty of networking organizations out there, whether it be Rotary or the Kiwanis Club or whatever. Um, there are plenty of places to go network, even as a college student. And I think what you're talking about is benchmarking yourself against some of the people that are already doing what you want to do. And uh, and then you can really figure out, okay, I need the following education credentials. I need the following uh, training. Maybe it's public speaking uh, experience, whatever, and start listing all those things and start going out and getting them. So that way you too would be considered for a similar role. And that has served me well, I think, over uh, my career for sure. So I love that strategy. Now, you're the founder of Learn, Earn, Retire, which you started in 2005. I'm curious, what made you want to start this company? Well, it was an accident. I, uh, I actually um, was at breakfast with the executive director of the Shea Sales Center, which is arguably the finest academic uh, sales program in the world. It's based in Ohio University. They had asked me to join the board and I was going out there and doing guest lecturing. So they said, well, um, why don't you uh, come out on a Saturday? Because uh, I came out twice a year for board meetings. If you could give us another Saturday and we'll put the students in the room and you can tell them how to become wealthy through sales because you've done that. And I said, I don't want to do it. And uh, I explained to them why, but let's make this story brief here. And so all of a sudden in frustration, the executive director puts his hand, okay, if I put 63 students in the room, by the way, there's 650 in the program now, but this was early days. I put 63 students in the room and you can tell them anything you want. What would you tell them? I said, well, you're not gonna like this, but the greatest thing they're gonna leave Ohio University with is not their accumulated knowledge nor their diploma. It's Microsoft uh, Outlook. Uh, with with uh, the names and contacts of all the vital people within their network. That's the game changer. That's where it's all happens. And you can put some precision and process on top of that. And we have hints to that on my website and certainly the course we've just developed. Um, what else? I said, well, you know, you, um, this, this is the most competitive juggernaut in the history of our country. So this is no time to go out and find yourself or or do a, a, a year of freedom and travel Europe. You know, this is pedal to the metal. Get, get your foot down there and get moving uh, in order to be successful. Uh, what else would you tell them? I said, they're all gonna get fired. I mean, we call it offshoring, onboarding, you know, outsourcing. I mean, we, we just, all these laid off. Okay, 
when you go into your boss's office and you're talking about what you're going to do over the next two quarters and you leave without a job, I don't care what they call it. You've been fired. Okay. So you have to be good at job search. And I'll give you a little statistic on this. The emerging generation that's coming off campuses today, uh, you know, the, in the next graduation year, their grandparents had one to two jobs, uh, you know, you know, generally. Their parents, okay, my generation, I'm a boomer. Um, it, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, 10 to 11 jobs, okay? Heidrich and Struggles, a good friend of mine, Kelly Kay, who's a, who's an executive with Heidrich, uh, and they're, they're a leading um, search and management firm around the globe. They did an internal study and believe the students leaving campus now are going to have 17 plus jobs. Okay, so what's that mean? If you do the math, it means the jobs are no longer careers. They're two to four year career stepping stones. So you have to go ahead and step wisely and you have to be great at getting a job. They said, what else would you tell them? And this was just extemporaneous. I, I was coming out and I, I said, well, you know what? They better know something about managing their money. And say, because it used to be the pension was done automatically for you. You know, I have these, you know, MBAs from these Ivy League schools, you know, trying to manage the pension fund. But you had money coming in and it was guaranteed, just depending upon how long you worked there. Those days are gone. 1978, they come out with the 401k and, uh, and, and the game is different. And the 401k regrettably didn't come with instructions. And if you take a look at the baby boom retiring right now, the news is not good. So this generation needs to go ahead and take it right from, from starting at 22 years old, you know, when they get their first job statistically, that's usually when it is, um, they need to go ahead and have this right. And, and, and so all of a sudden, we get called off because we had to go to class. So this breakfast was over. I go into the board meeting the next day. I was guest lecturing. That was a Thursday. Friday, I'm, I'm, I'm talking uh, uh, to one of the board members. And all of a sudden, the slide comes up and says, next April. So it gave me a year. Uh, Alan McMillan's going to be out here. And he's got a personal development day for our students. And I went, hell, I don't think I committed to that. I was just asking the question, what would you tell him if I put these kids in a room? So... Uh, so Larry McHale next door to me goes, hey, uh, I think you, you volunteered. You better, you better get on with it. <laughs> and I spent about 150 hours writing that, you know, the first year. And the reaction from students was explosive. They said, no one's teaching us this. So then I got invited to Indiana University. I got invited to Virginia Tech, my old alum, MIT. I was I was I was doing this stuff at, at Ohio University and I've been in front of tens of thousands of students and they're all going, no one's teaching us this. Oh, and so so uh, that's how it happened. And then it got exciting. And then when I retired, uh, I taught a class at OU and it exploded. And typically in a semester, 150 students. Uh, and it was it was great. And uh, I've segued out of that now. And I'm putting the class online because rather than reach hundreds of students a year. I want to reach thousands and tens of thousands. So they have a better trajectory. Their academics, uh, higher ed is terrific, okay, on academics. But they need a career strategy, like from starting, that you don't squander your 20s. What are you going to do for a career? How are you going to gain some advantage? And then the second one is uh, is financial. What are you going to do to get a great start? And Here's a little spoiler alert. If students really do the right things in their 20s, they start at 22 and they're average, not overachievers that are listening to your podcast that are going one extra, but just average. They've got an opportunity to make three to five million dollars put away at retirement. And you can live pretty nicely on that and enjoy, a you know, put your feet up and enjoy the fruits of your labor. And that's the dream we all have. Man, that's a master class you're just giving there on the podcast, Alan. That's fantastic. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. My alma mater at the University of Buffalo, they have uh, a level 400 entrepreneurship class. And they quickly, uh, you know, tackled me and said, Mike, we would love for you to be a guest lecturer for this class. Love and it. it's students, you know, from all over the world. The University of Buffalo is an international uh, university. 
Um, and it's really, you know, I did it last year and I just got an email from the professor uh, literally yesterday. Uh, and she said, would you be willing to be a guest lecturer again this year for the entrepreneurship class? And you're absolutely right. There are some things, even though I graduated from the business school with a degree in accounting from the University of Buffalo, not once did they teach me how to be an entrepreneur. I mean, I had to literally work alongside a CEO who was an entrepreneur, help him build the company from startup to over $25 million in annual sales. And then I understood how to build an entrepreneurial company. And it all started with the CRM package. No one talked about what a CRM package is and how to build a funnel. Like, where was that class? There was none. And so once I saw the CRM package and I understood the concept of building a sales funnel, and then I'm like, oh, okay, like this is how you build a business. And I literally take the students through my funnel, through my CRM package, so okay. they understand how I use it. And then suddenly you start to see these light bulbs are suddenly going off and all of their ideas about services and products and they start lighting up and they're like, oh, okay. But nobody, there's no class that'll teach you that. And so uh, I'm glad that you shared all of that info. Well, you're, the students in Buffalo are, are very fortunate to have you because really what you're talking about is building process. Right. And when you build process, that leads to predictability. Yes. And what do you better be if you're going to be an entrepreneur or you're going to be trying to you know, move up in a big corporation? You better be predictable. You yep. better be able to call an outcome and deliver, okay? And so, you know, understanding process and then you find best practice and you might have a little over here, a little over here, a little over here, and then you put that together and amalgamate into, you know, best process. Now you're on to something and it's enduring and you can teach it to others so you can build teams and move forward. 100%, yeah, it's all about the system, but you need a system in place, that process that you're talking about. Now, there's a lot of college students that graduated uh, recently here in the spring. There are gonna be some that are gonna be graduating here within the next year that are listening right now. And I think they would love to be in a situation where they have multiple job offers to choose from. So in your opinion, what is the best way for college students to graduate and have multiple job offers? Well, let's talk about the job search itself. First thing is your brand. What do you bring to the table? And I'm not talking about how you look on social media and, and, and how nice your pretty your resume is and how nice your LinkedIn profile is. I'm talking about what do you bring to the marketplace? And it starts with listening. What are the demands of the marketplace? And you trying to go ahead and, and uh, conform to that and exceed those expectations so you're sought after. So you take your brand, who you are, what you bring to the table. The amplifier is the network. And you said this earlier, this is so you need to grow, nurture, and, 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 and really uh, interact with your network in a way uh, that you can uh, you know, move forward. Because those are the folks that know where the jobs are. Those are the folks that know what's happening. And, and there's also elements that you can use for alumni. If you just graduated from college, you can do informational interviews. And you can go ahead and reach out through LinkedIn with alumni search. And by the way, I've got some of that on the website if it would help. But most students, when I show them this, they don't know LinkedIn's got the power to do this. So you 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 dive into that moment, and then and then uh, then you want to stay organized. You know, the trouble is you got some notes over here in this notebook. You got some some emails coming to your Gmail account. You got some phone calls coming in, and you got a lot of balls in the air. And how do you go ahead and manage those? So we have a system called Job Search Radar. It's a simple spreadsheet, but it's a way that you're kind of looking at um, an opportunity all at once because it's a question of not only finding it, but following up. And sometimes the, the, the best executives you're reaching out say, well, I reached out to him twice or her twice, and uh, I guess they're not interested. No, they're just busy. Reach out to him again. You know, just try to do that tenacity thing where you want to be persistent without being a pain in the ass. You know, that's that's the secret. Actually, it's a secret of life. Yeah, it is a secret of life. And I think we have to build up some of those social skills uh, as well, I think, uh, with uh, Gen Z. Um, I know, you know, my daughter, for example, I mean, you know, for her to call 
proactively a, a contact who she doesn't know personally. That's hard. That, you know, that's really, really tough. She's brilliant. Don't get me wrong. She's brilliant. She's way smarter than I am. But I have no qualms about picking up the phone and calling somebody I don't know. It, it doesn't bother me in the least. So I think, you know, we have to get over that. We have to start meeting new people if we want to get those multiple job offers, increase our network, and people have to know what it is that we're looking for. So on LinkedIn, we have to build an ease about talking about what we need and what we want. Um, and if we don't build that ease and talking about what we want, we're never going to get there. Um, so I think that's a, another piece. Now, let's assume they follow all of your advice, right? They get a great position after graduation. They're hired um, and they're in the right company where they want to be. How can they thrive in this new position now? Okay, let's talk about what they're going to do before they show up. Now, remember, you are being compared to other new hires. So maybe they've hired three or four people and you're coming in as a group and, and you're going to be compared against them. That's just the way life is. So most people, they get the job, they start celebrating. Yay, I've got a job. Not you. Because what you're going to do is you're going to reach out to that hiring manager and you're going to say, hey, listen, I just wanted to touch base first. Thank you. I am so grateful to be joining this company, this kind of organization that I'm really seeing uh, uh, is a spectacular place to work and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm thrilled you gave me the chance. But let's dial forward six months. If I'm in your office in six months and I come in and you go ahead and high five me, two of them, let's go, um, because you like how well I started, what would be those attributes that would get me to that wow moment? I mean, what, what would we do? What are your best people when they come in here? What do they do? And, and also, can we learn from the people that you thought were going to be good and they struggled and what did they do? Can you give me some early guidance? Um, that manager will be blown away that you're, you're thinking like that. And then also ask as you're in the, you get done with the call as you're, you're winding it up. You just say, Hey, look, I, I want to, uh, um, you know, just, just figure out everything I can do. And do you have any action steps again, that will better prepare me. Okay. And so that'll be, uh, that'll be exciting. The second thing you want to do, pre-report due diligence. You want to set up Google alerts, okay? If you don't know how to do it, go to YouTube and set it up. But basically, if your company that you're going to work for, and I would do the company and the top three competitors, okay? You know, you know, if they're in the press, you want to be notified about it. Now you start reading this targeted information and you're learning all about this. They're about to train you when you come on board. The other people are out partying like spring break. And well, you can party too. But the deal is you go ahead and uh, and and take a look at this and you're coming, <coughs> excuse me, you're coming up the knowledge curve in a, in a superior way. And then well, let's get back to the network. This is why it's 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 so important. You want to leverage your network. And do I know anybody that worked here? Do I know anybody that worked for a competitor? Do I know anybody that maybe worked in the past and doesn't work there anymore? And if you can leverage in like that and then ask them, hey, if you were showing up like me, what would you do? How would you better prepare that you're going you're gonna to go ahead and stand out? And then one last thing. This is the fourth step. Ready? Shh. Don't tell anybody, you know, when all of a sudden they go, gosh, you caught on so well, you know, you're doing so great. And, uh, and, 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 you know, it, we're ha happy. Well, you don't go, well, listen, I listened to this guy on the radio and this, you know, this uh, podcast was great. And I, I implement, no, you want them to know how smart you are. And actually it is really smart to prepare like that. So you take all the credit, but uh, don't spill the beans on the process. I love it. I think that's great. Well, if you're listening to the Fraternity Booty <laughs> podcast and you're getting this information from Alan McMillan, then you know that you're doing the right thing. You're already one step ahead of all of your competitors, as far as I'm concerned, uh, because this is uh, truly, truly gold. Now, let's assume for a moment now that the job they take out of college doesn't work out or they just figure out that it's not the right fit. You know, maybe uh, the values aren't congruent uh, between the company and the employee. How can they replace this job quickly and efficiently? Yeah, and uh, the, the first thing you're talking about, this, the way you set it up, is you want to do a stealth search. You want to go ahead and do a search uh, without, um, without tipping your hand and then all of a sudden having your employer going, well, we're thinking of a layoff, we're gonna put their name at the top of the list. So you, you, want, you wanna really be careful. 
Um, the first thing to do, um, I would turn up my performance at my current job. I would go at, because people have a tendency to start to slow down at their current role and look for their new role. And, you know, then you can't be as picky because if all of a sudden that puts you in a place where you're suspect or, you know, you're, you're, uh, you know, not doing so good in the eyes of the employer. So the first thing you do is bear down on what you currently have. Then you start looking at other opportunities, going through your network, figuring out what you want to do. This is, if you have a job, this is a beautiful moment because you have lots of time to be very choosy and very selective. And then you can go forward with that. And then you just do the stuff that you do, you know, uh, where you're, you're leveraging people, you're asking questions, you're finding what you want to do. You want to see the compensation levels or where you are. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and it's great. And, 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 but that's the path these students that are emerging from college are on right now. You know, they're going to have more roles than previous generations as we went through before. So if, if, if jobs have become two to four year stepping stones and they have, my advice is step wisely. <laughs> Very good advice. Let's talk about using money wisely. Let's think about the college students who are listening right now, they're in college. Um, as you know, I mean, there's there's two ways to build wealth, right? You could you, you could increase your income or you can lower your expenses, right? Um, and so, you know, for the college students who are listening right now, what advice do you have for them to use money wisely? I mean, should they have part-time jobs while they're in college and maybe enter the gig economy, maybe do some Uber and Lyft? Um, you know, are there tips that you have that they can reduce their expenses, maybe save money, uh, you know, on books and other things? I'm just worried about college student debt. I don't have to tell you about it. Um, you know, what's waiting for them after graduation could be crippling. No, it, it, you're, you're hitting on a really good point. So here's the key. You need to start off, and we're, this is a short podcast, so we can't go deep into this, uh -huh. but you have to have a preconceived plan that when you show up at that first employer, what you're going to do financially, you know? And so, you know, typically you're going to be handed a 401k, um, whatever, whatever, uh, and you want to ask critical question, does my employer, my new employer match? Okay. Now, the last job I worked in in corporate America, um, it was a Fortune 150 company. And we had, um, you know, for every dollar I put in, they put in, a, they matched a dollar up until 6%. Okay. So now, what is the minimum someone can put into that 401k as a freshman? And, and, and I mean, as a, as a new hire. What's the minimum? And it's the answer at the top of the match. So in that case, I just gave you, it'd be 6%. Well, if you've got to have a roommate where you didn't want one, <coughs> if you're going to have, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, live in a little more modest place, uh, maybe nurse this car that I had that I was dreaming I'd get rid of on the first job. Okay. You, you may have to go ahead and make some sacrifices in order to get to the top of the match. And then what I subscribe to, to folks is every subsequent raise you get in the next, let's say, you know, somewhere between three and five years, you hold your lifestyle flat. You don't go out now, get Disney plus and all these other platforms, you know, you have Netflix, it's enough. Okay. So you, 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 you want to go ahead and push those increases, those small incremental increases when you're getting started into the 401k until you're at 15%. And the experts say 12 to 15%. And I would be so bold to say, you want to get to 15% and put the employer match on top, okay? If you do that, and now you've learned to live more modestly, and as you grow beyond that, every, uh, every, uh, every time you get a raise, 85% goes to you for lifestyle. Buy that card, get those platforms, get the nicer place, do what you want to do. And always 15 goes towards creating wealth and I would say financial independence in this nearly pensionless world. I love it. That is really great advice. And I agree with you. I mean, for all the college students listening right now, I mean, 
Uh, yes, we're very fortunate to be on a college campus at an institution of higher learning, but we also figured out a way to live modestly while we were in college. You and bet. so we can just carry that over um, into our careers and just still live modestly and, and resist that temptation to say, well, I've earned it and going out and buying that brand new Ford Mustang uh, and instead just milk that car that you have, that used beater that you had in college and just extend that, uh, that money that you're putting away. And especially like Alan is talking about with that matching, that's free money. You got to okay. take that. You got to take that. And there's no reason why anybody should have any less than 6% in that scenario going towards the 401k to at least get the match and then start building on top of that as you get the raises. I think what Alan's talking about is uh, dead on. So thank you. Well, we, what, one thing on this, if you went to my website at learnearnretire.com, there's the student retirement calculator. This is the ability to go up to pay scale and see, okay, what is entry level wages on average? uh coming out of my school um you know what is uh what is um uh my likely earnings at age 42 you put that information in and then you start to calculate well if i start with six percent if i started with three percent if i started with this i started at 22 you can answer these questions and it runs the scenario it says okay this is how much money under this scenario and there's no prediction of the future no one has a crystal ball but you know based on history, it's likely you're gonna end up with this much money. And let's say it's $5 million. Okay, what the hell does a student know about $5 million? My first IPO, I made three and a half million dollars and I have very little to show for it. Now I had a motor yacht. I said, boy, that was good. That was a million dollars doing that for five years. But, but the, and I named it after my wife. That was a smart move. I mean, <laughs> you know, if you're listening, go and steal my stuff, hack my life here. But, but the thing is, um, but I, I whizzed it away. Yeah. And the thing is, I didn't have a plan. And most people don't. So then what happens is the calculator says, okay, you're likely to be making X when you're, uh, when you retire. Now, if you were taking four, four and a half percent, which is kind of the rule, and we can get into that another day, uh, and 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 now you can pay yourself like 60% more in retirement, and hopefully you've gone into retirement with zero debt, you know, and if you do that, wow, you're putting your feet up and you're really uh, racing for a great time. Wow. Well, learn from Alan. Uh, I think uh, that's the moral of the story. So this is really, really good. Now, listen, uh, you know, we love Ohio University uh, here at Greek University. We love good food here as well on the Fraternity Foodie podcast. So the next time that I'm speaking on campus at Ohio University, where should I go for a great bite to eat? All right. There is one answer to this. OK. <laughs> and it's and it's and it's Athens Zone. Ohio University in Athens, Ohio is Obetti's. It is the greatest hot dog restaurant in the world. And I knew you were going to ask this question. Okay, so what I'm going to do is share my favorite. Okay, so you think a hot dog restaurant and this is low price and stuff like that. No, 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 no. This is an amazing, funky place based on burlesque. I'm not making this stuff up. So I order the Varla. Now you have three choices. You can get the, the shy Varla, which is tofu. And, and that's what I do when I... I, I it, I can't believe I'm saying this, but the, it's so packed with flavor. You can do this. You can get a bratwurst or a hot dog. And these come with natural skin casings. These are premium dogs. Okay. And then the Varla, dig this, sauerkraut, crunchy, homemade bacon, homemade horseradish, and then Thousand Island dressing on the top. Let me tell you. <laughs> and their signature fries, which are just off the hook. I mean, it's unbelievable. And if you're a vegan, vegans love this place because they uh, uh, it's vegan friendly. And 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 they and they use the tofu dog. And now they're eating one of the things they thought was a for, forbidden fruit. So Obetti's in Athens is incredible, and you can also find them at Obetti's.com. The people of Athens, Ohio are celebrating because you answered the question correctly. You got it. <laughs> you got an A plus. If you answered anything else, then you would have been wrong. But you answered correctly today. So congratulations, Alan McMillan. All right. So if our student listeners want to learn more about your digital course offerings on the website, if they want to invite you to speak on their college campus, where is the best place for them to go and to connect with you? Okay. They can just go up to... Um, 
learnearnretire.com. You can reach me at Alan, A-L-A-N, at learnearnretire.com. Uh, but I'll tell you what, let's, let's do something for your listeners. And I appreciate you putting me uh, on this and you got a you, prestigious podcast. And, and I really was thrilled that, uh, you know, you asked me to come on board. So the course, which is the same course I, I, I was teaching at Ohio university. Um, now we do that course, uh, all on video with the graphics, with supporting material, with workbooks that you can use. And we do it for a whopping $299. However, if somebody's listening to this and they want to do it, and I'll send you a link so they can come back and they can get the link off your site, we'll knock $100 off. So it's only $199, which is less than a lot of those crazy textbooks that you're never going to read your whole freaking life, you know? <laughs> and this is something you can have access to years down the road. And you, let's say, God forbid, you got laid off. You go right to the section of three years out and blindsided, what you're going to do. And we walk through and we can be your coach. So there's lots of good material. And some of the things that we talked about this morning might say, well, I'd like to go deeper. The course goes deeper in those things. And we point you to other places too. That's great. Well, check out the show notes. And in there, we are going to put the code so that way and the link. So that way you can go directly to Alan's website and get that discount because that is a great deal. Anytime you get any information from Alan, it is right on the money. And I agree with him. There are some textbooks you're never even going to crack the spine, but this is going to be a worthy investment because you're talking to the guy who's been there and done that in Alan McMillan. So Alan, thank you so much for spending time with us this morning. Our college students are very grateful and uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thanks for having me. Sure. My pleasure. And to our student listeners, if you enjoyed this talk with Alan, make sure that you like it on social media. Make sure that you share it on social media with other college students that need this information. It is so critical. I wish both Alan and I both, we wish that we had this information when we were in college. Nobody taught us. And so we had to go out there and figure it out ourselves. So we're trying to help you as much as we can. So thanks so much. And uh, for our listeners, Thanks for being with us today. We hope to see you on another episode of the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. Thanks again. We'll see you next time.